Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 21st lecture in our wood design series. In this video, we'll be following up on our previous discussions of beam lateral stability, taking a look at some prescriptive methods of bracing uh, solid sawn lumber beams against lateral torsional buckling. Today's lovely music comes from the artist Daniel Birch, again from his album Ambient Volume 1, and as always, a link is included in the video description. Now, previously we have considered the NDS's beam stability factor, CL. We have explored what its purpose is and how to calculate it, um, and you can see the two pre previous videos in this series if you haven't seen those. Now, generally I would recommend calculating the beam st uh, stability factor where appropriate, while it is more complex than some of the other uh, factor calculations that we've looked at, it is relatively easy to implement via spreadsheet or automated calculation sheet, such as SMATH. Still, in the name of uh, completion and thoroughness, I did want to touch on another method of addressing uh, beam lateral stability, the, and that is the uh, prescriptive method. The NDS does provide an alternative method of addressing lateral torsional buckling, and again, this method is to use uh, prescriptive provisions. Now, these prescriptive provisions are laid out in NDS uh, section 4.4.1, which is shown here. So here the NDS provides prescriptive requirements that can be used in lieu of the beam stability factor calculation. So the first thing to note about this section is that these uh, rules are only applicable to sawn lumber. In other words, you can't use these, uh, you can't apply these to roof trusses, eye joists, gulam beams, CLT, MPP, or really anything other than just plain old ordinary solid sawn lumber. So if you're making a beam out of a two by six, you'll be able to use these if you wish, but if you're using something like an eye joist, you won't be able to use these. So uh, I do want to talk a bit about what these sort of represent historically. What these really represent is a kind of historical holdover uh, to, more to more traditional design methods. In previous lectures, we've discussed the general uh, historical transition from prescriptive design provisions and rules of thumb to calculation-based provisions uh, based on mechanics, stress, deflections, that sort of thing. These rules are the shown here are similar to uh, the types of rules that are part of traditional uh, wood construction and carpentry. Before design codes were developed, wooden buildings would be constructed according to rules passed down the carpentry trade from one generation to another, from master to apprentice, that kind of thing. This is, this is how traditional construction was done, really going back many, many centuries through the ages. In other words, if you were building a wooden building in the year 1600, if you wanted a wall of a certain height, you would use timbers of a certain size. If you wanted a floor or a roof spanning a certain distance, you would use beams of a certain depth and thickness, and then provide bracing where appropriate at certain intervals. These rules of traditional carpentry and the builder's trade uh, weren't cre were not created from calculations of basic mechanics and physics calculations, rather they were created through generations of trial and error. In other words, at some point someone built a building that uh, wasn't stiff enough to meet uh, whatever the physics demanded, it fell over or collapsed, and then uh, they developed a rule saying, oh well, we better not build something uh, quite as uh, slender when we're making a floor system or something like that. So again, this sort of represents uh, traditional prescriptive and rule of thumb based approaches. Now, so these prescriptive rules in 4.4.1.2 here follow in that tradition. Now, these rules uh, are not directly copied from, you know, sort of ancient carpentry practices. They do have mechanical theory and research behind them. In other words, they're not just traditional carpentry rules taken verbatim and then pasted into the code. They're designed to, prescript to prescriptively provide a similar level of safety as the beam stability factor calculations. So the earliest building codes that you, if you would look at them, say like the late 19th, early 20th centuries, they tended to be more prescriptive than calculation based. And there are still many design engineers, um, especially in fields like wood design, who want to be able to design uh, at least some of their uh, floor systems to these older prescriptive methods. So these provisions allow the continued use of more prescriptive, this more prescriptive approach. Um, so if you would prefer not to use the somewhat uh, complex calculations uh, seen in the meme stability factor, you can use these. Now, in theory, uh, using the beam stability factor 
would enable an overall more efficient structure, no more a more efficient structure, as prescriptive rules always have to be implemented with a bit more uh, uh, in a bit more conservative manner than you can when you're actually performing calculations. So when you use these rules, you're not com compromising on safety. If they, you know, when when making design codes, they never uh, put something in there if it's going to compromise safety. Uh, but so you can use them, but you may end up with a structure that's a little more conservative than you would get if you're doing the full, uh, the full beam stability factor calculations. So again, these rules aren't unsafe, though perhaps they are less efficient or a little more conservative than you would get if you do the full beam stability calculations. Now, as you look through these, you can see that they represent increasingly stringent provisions based on the depth to width ratio of the beam you're sizing. Uh, for example, Part A says that if you are that you have if you have a very stubby beam, uh, you need no lateral support whatsoever. Part B says that once you, the ratio exceeds uh, exceeds two and up to four, you need to brace the ends brace, brace the ends of the beam against uh, rotation. Part C says that from four to five, you need to brace the compression portion of the beam along its entire uh, along its entire length, and brace the ends against rotation. Part D says that from uh, a ratio of five to six, you have to brace the ends, brace the compression flange, uh, okay, well, compression flange, compression edge, I should say, and provide full solid blocking or bracing uh, no more than every eight feet. So um, at least every eight feet. And then E states that you have to fully brace uh, both sides of the beam against rotation along the entire length and provide end restraint against rotation. Now, note, you do not need to provide the blocking or bridging outlined in uh, case D uh, for case E because you're providing continuous bracing of both sides of the beam, and that is going to be a stiffer requirement than um, having blocking or bracing at different intervals. So, and uh, now you might ask, what happens if you have a D over B ratio greater than 7? Well, if in that case you're kind of on your own, uh, you simply aren't allowed to use these provisions if you have um, if you have a uh, beam uh, depth to width ratio greater than seven. You simply have to use the full beam stability factor calculations, or more likely, you probably should just select a different section. Also, uh, one very important thing to note on this: these are based on nominal dimensions, not actual dimensions. So, in other words. Uh, if you were calculating, uh, if you were considering a two by twelve as a beam, you would you you would have a D over B ratio of six, um, based on the nominal dimensions. And if you were to calculate them, ca calculate that based on the actual dimensions, you would get a value of seven point five. So again, you use the nominal or sticker dimensions, not the uh, for the two by twelve. You literally just take twelve over two, not eleven point two five over one point five. So also note that 4.4.1.3 provides uh, some provisions for beam column members where you have both uh, flexure and compression, uh, flexure and compression on the same element. Now I put together this little table here to summarize these uh, prescriptive provisions uh, found in the section we just discussed. So note that a beam that as a beam section becomes more slender, the bracing requirements become more stringent. So we start out with uh, just looking at uh, if we have um, for the end restraint requirements, we have to apply that to anything with a ratio greater than two. If we have, if, we want, if we're talking about uh, total compression end bracing or total compression edge bracing, that applies for ratios greater than four. Blocking and uh, bracing are only required between five and six, although you often will provide them at other ratios, and. Uh, you would have to have uh, blocking or bracing on the six to seven range, except uh, beyond six, if you're using the prescriptive requirements, they require total uh, bracing along both the tension and compression sides. And that continuous bracing along the entire uh, length is gonna be a lot stiffer than what you have, uh, than what you get from just intermittent uh, blocking. So that's not required there. So again, the table here summarizes those requirements. Um, as they become, as your elements become more slender, the uh, provisions and the requirements become uh, more stringent. 
Now, if you're not familiar with what uh, blocking, bracing, etc. actually look like uh, physically in this context, we will cover that in the next video. Uh, this video is just meant to be a brief discussion of the prescriptive methods of providing beam uh, lateral restraint uh, for solid sod and lumber as a uh, as an alternative to using the beam stability factor calculations discussed in previous videos. All right, and I think that will do it for today. I just wanted to provide a short video illustrating an alternate method for addressing uh, beam lateral stability. Keep in mind, you can only apply these provisions for beams made of solid sawn lumber. If you have anything else, you're going to have to uh, use the full beam stability factor calculations, unfortunately, like it or not. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this video interesting or useful, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you want to help make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. I would also like to thank our existing patrons, uh, Stefan, Edmund, and Logan. Thank you for all your support. Regardless, we'll be back soon with another video in this series. Our next video will be our final video on beam stability, a look at what lateral bracing actually physically looks like uh, for those who may be unfamiliar. We'll be introducing and displaying uh, joist hangers, blocking, bracing, etc., and how are these are implemented in construction. If you are interested, be sure to be on the lookout for that video shortly. Regardless, I look forward to seeing you all then or in later lectures. I look forward to seeing you all again soon, and as always, thank you.